Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Deli Carpini, and I'm the dean here at the Annenberg School for Communication. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Annenberg School, the University of Pennsylvania, and today's panel, Remembering the Letter from a Birmingham Jail. In an op-ed that appeared in the New York Times on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail, Jonathan Ryder wrote that we often focus on the, quote, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s appeal to the American dream and his embrace of the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. But this view of King, uh, Professor Ryder goes on to write, as an ardent proponent of American exceptionalism, fails to capture a significant part of his thinking, a set of ideas embodied in one of his most famous works, Letter from Birmingham Jail. What we remember today as a stirring piece about freedom and justice was also a furious reading of American history and an equally indignant attitude towards King's white contemporaries. It is this, end of quote, it is this furious reading of American history, I love that line, Jonathan, that is part of the subject of his recent and insightful book, Gospel of Freedom, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Letter from Birmingham Jail and the Struggle that Changed a Nation. A book, I might add, as many of you know, that will be available uh, uh, at the end of this talk right outside, and John will stay around to sign, so please take advantage of that. It will also be the subject, at least in part, of today's panel. I should mention that one of the ways you can tell about the import of both a topic and a speaker or set of speakers is by the number of co-sponsors of that event, and we have a number of them to thank for this particular event, so I'll just uh, thank them real quickly. The University of Pennsylvania's African American Resource Center, Penn's Center for Africana Studies, Penn's Chaplain's Office, and the Departments of History and Religion at Penn, as well as the Fox Leadership Program here, and the Netter Center for Community Partnerships. In addition, it's being co-sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. So let me do a brief introduction of John, and then uh, he will come up here to introduce the panelists themselves. So Jonathan Ryder is the chair of the Sociology Department at Barnard College, Columbia University, has been so since 1990. He's director of Barnard's Civic Engagement Program, which connects participants to community leaders and activists, organizations and strategies to spark passion and creativity in addressing local and global issues. In addition to his role in the sociology department, he has affiliations with Barnard's American Studies Department, Jewish Studies Department, and Human Rights Studies Department. And he is a member of the graduate faculty at Columbia University, He's author of numerous books, articles, essays, uh, too many to mention, but I will mention his one 2008 book with Harvard University Press, The Word of the Lord is Upon Me, The Righteous Performance of Martin Luther King, in addition, of course, to the book that we'll be talking about or talking from today. I want to add in my last set of comments on John on a personal note. I first met him in 1990, hard to believe. We were colleagues for 10 years at Barnard and Columbia, and while we're approximately the same age, he has served as a role model for me on a number of levels. He pointed out to me that one can be a serious, respected scholar and a world-class, committed teacher, that one can be a serious scholar and an administrator, something I've learned from a lot in my role as dean here, that you can be a serious scholar and a community leader, and that you can be a serious academic scholar and a public intellectual. And, maybe most importantly, you could do serious, empirically grounded academic research and do it in a way that still addresses major normative and applied issues of import. Lastly, he has shown to me that you can be a serious scholar and a very good human being. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jonathan Ryder. Michael may have been too generous on my organizational skills compared to what he's done at Annenberg, but I appreciate that very much. Um, the first three speakers for tonight, all in different ways, have embodied a concept that's key to the letter from Birmingham Jail. King talks about 
extremists for love and justice. And at a certain point, after trying to convince the white clergy that have criticized him, he says, no, 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 I am an extremist for love and justice. And I'm not gonna give lengthy introductions, but we have three distinguished speakers coming your way. First, Joyce Miller, who graduated from Harvard Law School in 1974 at a time that very few blacks or women were graduating from Harvard Law School, and she went on to embody that kind of vision of extremists for, judge, for justice in a variety of ways, from the Penn Legal Clinic to desegregation efforts, and most notably for the theme of tonight with the American Friends Service Committee, where she did wonderful work on the National Community Relations Division, and she was Assistant General Secretary for Justice and Human Rights. Uh, Reverend James Allen is the senior pastor, is the pastor of Vine Memorial Baptist Church, a West Philadelphia institution. And again, one of these uh, ministers who has embodied King's commitment to the notion that there's a link between this world and the other world, and that a purely otherworldly, disengaged uh, Christianity leaves out too many things that are worth including and that are urgent to include and has done great work, again, in government, on city housing task force, and too many other areas of human relations, and we're honored to have him as well. And finally, Dr. Kevin Johnson of Bright Hope Baptist Church, Again, the very uh, historically notable church that he has taken and updated in his own way. A, another link to uh, Martin Luther King Jr., a Morehouse man who inducted into the Morehouse Board of Preachers. And he too has, in all his work from his columns in the Philadelphia Tribune to his more national efforts in his preaching and his other civic engagement, has also embodied that notion that a prophetic Christianity has something to say to this worldly pursuits and has embodied that. So I think I will leave it at that uh, simple level and say I'm delighted first to have Reverend Allen, who come, will talk to us um, about uh, his experience uh, with the black church and Dr. King and struggles for justice. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me say I was told uh, when I walked in that uh, we do have a, a, a main speaker. And I had anticipated speaking for perhaps an hour or 15 minutes or something like that. And, and I've, I've been told I can't do that. Yeah. Um, and secondly, I'm scheduled to speak at a church tonight also. And, um, and so I'll get right to what I'm supposed to deal with. Now, I'm, I, I'm, I was told that I am to talk about what I know about Dr. King and my experience with him. The first thing I uh, always say when I'm asked to do something like that is to let people know that I do not claim to have been a close compadre with Dr. King. Uh, I do not claim to be his friend, to have been his friend. Um, I knew him, I met him, but uh, I was uh, a seminarian at the time. Well, actually, I, prior to my seminary time is when I met him, I, I guess you could call him, call it meeting him. He was the main speaker for the National Baptist Congress of Christian Education, what we call Booker T. Washington Night. That was in 1960 in Buffalo, New York. Um, I met him that night, but I met him in such a way that he was surrounded, and I went up to shake hands with him, and he was surrounded, so I just reached through the crowd and touched him. <laughs> and uh, th that's how I first met him. The following year, I enrolled uh, at the Interdenominational Theological Center of Atlanta, the Mohouse Division of the seminary, and uh, it, was, it was there that I actually officially met Dr. King. Uh, I met him on the same day that he delivered the installation sermon uh, for Dr. Ralph Abernathy at the West Hunter Street Baptist Church. And the context in which I met him um, I did not go to church that morning because I was a slow student 
and I had to stay and study. And so that afternoon, I felt that I was perhaps ready for the classes, and I decided to walk around through the, the area to see if I could find a church where there was service going on, and I walked up on West Hunter, not knowing uh, what was going on, and I saw all of the cars. I said, church must be going on here, and I went in and discovered that Dr. Ralph Abernathy was being installed, and Dr. King delivered the installation message. Um, now, when I, when I say I met him that day, I did not go up to shake hands with him after the service because I was too afraid to even get close to him. And so I came outside and was standing in front of the church um, trying to decide whether or not I would go and spend my 50 cent. Uh, and that's all I had was 50 cent. And that 50 cent was supposed to last me until Friday. Um, you could get a hamburger at that time for 10 cents. And I was trying to decide whether or not I should go buy a hamburger and then go back to the dormitory, or should I fast for the rest of the day and, then, and, and do the hamburger tomorrow? Um, and as I was standing there, I looked to my right, and I, uh, I'd heard some shuffling there, and I looked to my right, and it was Dr. King. He had come out, and he was waiting for Mrs. King to pick him up. And after I fainted, uh, I, 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 I turned around and introduced myself to him and stood there for about 10 minutes, I guess, waiting for Mrs. King, talking with him. Um, and, and I went back to the dormitory, and I decided to sell handshakes for a dollar each. <laughs> so, you know, um, so it, it was that day that I, I met Dr. King. After that, I went to Ebenezer a couple of Sundays uh, when he happened to have been there. And one Sunday, I went up and spoke to him after he had preached, and he invited me to come back to his study. And uh, I was in, listen, I was in seven heavens at that time. You just walk back there to sit, to sit down in Dr. King's study, you know. And, um, and he, he was changing clothes, and he was talking to me as, as he... And I only asked him one question all of the time that I had known him. I only asked him one question. I asked him what was his most difficult concern. Um, and he said this. His difficult concern, well, most difficult concern, was that white people did not understand that freedom belonged to everybody. And black people did not seem to understand that we should not attempt to exchange one tyranny for another. That basically is what he said. He, he elaborated a little bit, but basically that's, that's what he said. Um, and of course, uh, after that, um, it was during the Birmingham struggle. Uh, after I'd, I'd uh, come through seminary, it was during the Birm Birmingham struggle uh, that um, a group of us, and at that time I passed it in Little Rock, Arkansas, and a group of us, or that's a group of us, five of us, uh, went down to Birmingham for the marches and the demonstrations. And again, I was too nervous to even go up and shake hands with Dr. King. Um, I did speak to him, but he, again, he was surrounded, and busy, and so forth, and, and so I do not claim to have been his friend uh, or close to him because I was too nervous to get that close to him, yeah. Um, the other thing I would share with you, and I was told to talk about what I knew, and, and, and that's very, the other thing I would like to um, talk about, the day before he was assassinated, I was preaching in a simultaneous revival in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, and we would have noonday service. And all of the churches were having revival at the same time. And there were pastors there from all over the country. And we would have the noonday service together, and then in the evening we would go to the different churches where we were speaking. That day at the noonday service, and I don't remember uh, the person or the preacher who was uh, talking. We were standing around before the service talking, and we were talking about the movement and talking about Dr. King. And one of the persons in that group had been a classmate in, in a seminary with Dr. King. And he said this to us as we were standing there talking, I believe Martin wants to be, we were talking about his safety 
and the fact that we didn't think he was being protected as he moved from city to city, uh, as he should have been. And he said, I believe Martin wants to be assassinated. I think he's weary on the journey, and I think he wants to be assassinated. I think he's weary with the task that has been his and the load that he has been carrying, et cetera. Um, and, and all of us expressed uh, some concern about that very thing. And it was the next day that he was shot down in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, the thing that I, I cherish, I suppose, about Dr. King was, number one, his humility. Uh, he was a very congenial kind of person. Um, seminary student, inviting me to come and sit in his office to talk with him. Uh, his, his congeniality uh, made me expand my chest, uh, and I've just gotten it down <laughs> since, since I've been here um, because I've been told that I'm not all of that in a bag of chips. You know? <laughs> so so I, I, you know, I, I came down real quick a, a, after I got here. But uh, I remember his, his congeniality, his, 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 his humility. Um, I also reflect upon his courage. Uh, he was a person of extreme courage uh, to, to face what he faced over and over again um, and to do it in such a way that you would not look at him and think that there was any fear, any trepidation, any reluctance whatsoever, or whatsoever uh, to, to face what he was facing and do what he was doing. Um, and, and I think of that as being a courageous individual. But I've heard many people talk about his affinity to Gandhi and that his method of struggle he adopted from Gandhi. I want to suggest to you that maybe he adopted the strategy of Gandhi, but he adopted the attitude of Jesus Christ. And he would say that himself emphatically. Um, and and that, that was the kind of person he was. He was inclusive, and he believed that there was, there was a, an obligation on the part of both uh, black people, and of course, at that time, we were not black. We hadn't gotten black yet. <laughs> we were still Negroes um, when, when we were referred to properly. We were Negroes. That was, that was another word that they used also uh, for us, or colored. You know. But at that, at that time, uh, that, that's the way it was. But anyway, he, he, was, he was concerned that, that we would have the kind of spirit as we would go into this new era. And he really believed that it would come to pass. Uh, he, he was not just talking about it. He really believed that it would, it would come to pass and that the freedom that was due uh, every American would in fact come to pass. And, and uh, uh, as a result of it, it inspired him and motivated him to the degree that uh, he would say to, to, to black people that you must be prepared to go into this, this new, new age. Um, and I, uh, you heard him speak as much probably as I have and you heard him always say that uh, he who gets behind in a race must ever remain behind or run faster than the person in front. And what he would urge upon us to do is to prepare ourselves for this coming era and this, the, the, the unfolding drama that was always, whenever Dr. King showed up anywhere, it was drama. It, it, it was just, uh, uh, he, he came to Little Rock uh, when I pa passed it there. Uh, again, um, I spoke to him, but he did not come to the church. I invited him to come to the church where I passed it. But uh, there was a friend of his with whom he grew up um, uh, in Atlanta who passed it there, and he came to his church. Uh, and, and, and I was privileged, uh, I thought, to sit in the pulpit with him that day. And, and he spoke uh, the same, uh, very similar to what he has spoken at our National Congress. And I, uh, uh, am I going too long? Uh, okay. 
He spoke very similar to what he spoke uh, in that night. He talked about moving to another mountain. And perhaps many of you have heard uh, that, that, that sermon, moving to another mountain. And, uh, and, and, he, and he said, we have been in this mountain long enough. It's time for us to move to another mountain. And I must admit, uh, Reverend Johnson doesn't have to do this, but I must admit that I pleasurized uh, his message and preached it myself uh, in some places where I thought maybe uh, others had not. I, you know, I, I alanized it a little bit, but uh, I've I, I preached that in many places, moving to another mountain, it's, it's time to move. And perhaps that message is relevant today. We still have not moved as far ahead as we should. We have not moved as far, far forward as we should. And perhaps this kind of setting will incite us and motivate us to even do more in order to see to it that the American dream about which Dr. King spoke will be realized. And I think, I think his warning to African Americans was an appropriate warning because we must not take one tyranny away and then substitute another. Uh, just because we get our freedom does not mean that we must misuse it, but we must use it for the benefit of all people. And I suppose that's about what I would want to say about Dr. King in terms of what I know and my experience with him. Um, and again, I emphasize that I was not a King buddy. I was not a part of the inner circle because after Dr. King died, and, and let me just say this, when I passed it in Little Rock, when Dr. King was alive, uh, I was a member of the Baptist Minister's Conference there, and you could hardly mention Dr. King's name. Nobody seemed to care for him. There were only four of us in the whole group who actually supported Dr. King. But after he died, everybody became his friend. <laughs> everybody loved Martin Luther King after he was assassinated. It is, you know, isn't it an amazing thing that after you die, that you become so popular? Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. uh, maybe, uh, maybe I ought to hurry up and die so that I can get... <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I might even ask the Lord to let me die and then come back and see how <laughs> yeah, everybody... Uh, but, so so I, that's why I emphasize over and over again, I was not a part of the inner circle. I was not real close to Dr. King. I was privileged to meet him and I cherish the moments that I was able to spend with him. Thank you very much. I'm Joyce Miller, and I am affiliated with the American Friends Service Committee. And that's a proud thing for me. Uh, it's been since 1969, so I guess that's close to 40 years and more than half my life. And I'm very proud to be able to speak to you tonight because it was the American Friends Service Committee that had established a relationship with Dr. King with Andy Young and with all of the members that got them to say, would you please publish this letter from the Birmingham jail? And the AFSC stepped up to the plate and in its first printing of 50,000 copies and had those available and sent around the country. We've made some other printings since then as the American French Service Committee, and I do think that that is something that is very important, to be able to have that kind of relationship with the SCLC, with Dr. King, with all the other people, and that's an example, not an exception to what the American French Service Committee is about. We must have people on the ground. We must have people in the national office who also know what
what's going on in local communities and who know how to talk to people in local communities, who know how to find people like I was when I first became involved with the American Friends Service Committee in 1969. At the time that I first became involved, the South was still segregated. The schools were still segregated. Those schools did not really get desegregated until many years had passed by. And I was working in the state of Georgia, and 81 school districts were ordered to desegregate at one time. Now, that's not freedom of choice. We were finally past freedom of choice. But what did that mean for real? And what did I have to do as an American Friends Service Committee staff person? I had to monitor. I had to take notes. I had to file letters of complaint about the realities. Reality number one, black students, your bus goes to the back of the school. And after you get off your bus, you go to hallway number one. White students, your bus goes to the front of the school. And after you get off, you go to a different hallway. And they wanted to call that integration. They had some other things. Oh, let's change all of the toilet seats. We can't possibly go to a formerly all-black school and ask white people to sit on toilet seats. The South had more ways to put people down who were African American, then I can take the time to talk about tonight. But I do want to call attention back to that letter. 50,000 copies, those weren't even enough. But the American Friends Service Committee has never been a rich organization in terms of its money. It's always been a rich organization in terms of the people it attracts, its leadership, so that when Barbara Moffitt was called by Andy Young, this was a call from one person to another person, people who knew each other, not a stranger calling a national office and going through the switchboard, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, can I find somebody who will help me? And that's the beauty, I think, also of the American Friends Service Committee. You can be Joyce Miller in Georgia, or you can be our new executive secretary, director, whatever we're calling them these days. And people will know you at the local level and at the national level and at the international level. And that is really important. And that's why Dr. King and the other members of SCLC also trusted the American Friends Service Committee because people came when they were asked, people came when they weren't asked. And that was important to the movement. And it was important that we were talking not just African Americans like me, but white people who stepped up to the plate and understood how important it was to make the reality of Dr. King permanent in the letter from a Birmingham jail. I want to say one other thing, and that is that the connection of nonviolence that Dr. King espoused was second nature to Quakers, second nature to the American Friends Service Committee. And fortunately, it was second nature for me. And I'll just give you one example of the work I had to do. I was in this small town, and Lester Maddox was the governor of Georgia, and he sent 100 state troopers, fully armed, big mass, I, I don't know guns from guns, but I know some you have on the hips and some you have like this. Well, they had the ones like this. I 
was nervous. And I had some students who were in college pushing the high school students up to confront that body of 100 people. And when one of the kids went running toward the 100 people, I was glad I was young because all I knew to do was to run and tackle him. That might not have seemed nonviolent, but it saved his life. So sometimes you get a little confused about what's violent and what's not violent. But I want you to know saving lives was not in my job description. I know it wasn't in my job description. But I know that the AFSC would have wanted me to do everything I could to bring about peace. And who I searched out the white people who were on the right side. And one of them happened to be the sheriff. And that was good. You go as an American Friends Service Committee person and you talk to people and you find out their true being. And when you can do that, regardless of race, because you have to do that, I would be glad to do that. And I say to everybody who's here now, reach out still. We have not reached the promised land in this country. The economic disparity today is worse than it was a long time ago for a lot of people. So we've still got work to do. I urge you to join any organization, not just the American Friends Service Committee, though I would like it, but join an organization. Remember the letter from Birmingham jail. There is so much beauty in that. There is so much discussion about how we need to live our lives, and we cannot forget that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here, and I want to thank uh, Jonathan Ryder and, of course, the University of Pennsylvania for hosting uh, this event as we reflect upon the life of Dr. King. Glad to be joined this evening with uh, Ms. Miller, and of course, um, one of my mentors and someone I greatly look up to, uh, Dr. James Allen, and I see uh, Dr. Chapman here as well. Uh, I am a part of, I guess you call it, Generation X, and, or Next, as some people have called it. And there is a question as to whether or not folk who are from my generation really care about the civil rights movement, uh, whether or not they really care about injustice that takes place uh, continually in this world. And one of the reasons I ended up going to Morehouse College in 1992 was because of Dr. King. Uh, in my house, like in many black homes, uh, you would have two people, uh, you maybe three people. You would have a picture of Jesus Christ, and Martin Luther King Jr. And if you were really progressive, you may have JFK somewhere in there too. <laughs> and I remember being in my grandparents' house and seeing this picture of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Did not know anything about Morehouse College. Uh, my home pastor, uh, Joseph C. Parker Jr., uh, his father uh, was a good friend of Dr. King. And Reverend Parker, my pastor, he went to Morehouse and uh, he recruited me when I was in junior high school and told me I need to go to Morehouse. And I did not know anything about Morehouse. And I said, okay, tell me more about it. He says, an all-male school. I said, oh, no, I don't want to go to an all-male school. <laughs> and um, then they told me that Spelman College was across the street. I said, I think I may have to. That's an all-female school. I may have to give it some thought. Um, but I never forget um, his wife, she drove me to Atlanta, and I saw this beautiful statue of Dr. King uh, right in front of the Martin Luther King Jr. Chapel. And as I looked at it, um, I could see why this was so important for me to come. And as I began to read the words that are there on the statue and even in the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel, uh, words that continue to pierce my soul, 
uh, I said I wanted to go to Morehouse. And while there at Morehouse, I learned about Dr. King, and there's a program there called the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel Assistance. I was blessed to become the King Scholar uh, while I was there at Morehouse. And my story is an interesting story because Morehouse denied me entry twice, um, but because of my pastors advocating for me, not only did I get in, uh, but graduated uh, Phi Beta Kappa, uh, went on from there to Union Theological Seminary, and eventually earned my doctorate from Columbia University. Why is all... <laughs> Thank my mama, not me. <laughs> um, why is all of this important? It is important because I am deeply rooted in the philosophies of Dr. King. Dr. King said our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. It's interesting what's happening in particularly black America now. We have the first African-American president, uh, somebody I supported, uh, even had a breakfast for, uh, even when Governor Rendell and Mayor Nutter were supporting then-Senator Hillary uh, Rodham Clinton, who I thought was a great candidate, but I just chose Barack. Um, I supported him over because I thought and I really believed in his vision for where he was trying to take the country. But I must say to you now, uh, that this quote by Dr. King, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. For me, when you begin to look at the African-American community, and if you have not read it, I encourage you to do so. I penned an article uh, that was published in the Philadelphia Tribune on April 14th uh, that is entitled, A President for Everyone Except Black People. I share that with you because I felt like I had to speak because I am deeply rooted in the tradition of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When you look at the fact when President Obama became president that the unemployment rate was somewhere around 12.7 uh, or 6 percent uh, in 2009, and then you look at the unemployment rate four years later, and it's now 13.8 percent, we can no longer remain to be silent. When you look at the fact, when you compare President Obama uh, to other presidents, uh, particularly when you look at cabinet positions, and the reason why cabinet positions are so important, when you look at someone like Eric Holder, he has a budget of $27 billion, has over 100,000 employees, so cabinet positions, they matter. And when you look at the fact that up until Bill Clinton, every other president would only have one African American in the cabinet at a time. But it was Bill Clinton uh, during his presidency who had seven African Americans in cabinet positions, women and men, but he did it. Even when you look at George Bush, no matter what opinion you may have about him, he had four African Americans in his cabinet, his 15 cabinet positions. And then when you look at President Barack Obama. And I know my wife, she thinks he's the cutest thing on the face of the earth. <laughs> she loves herself some Barack. But when you look at the fact out of all of his 15 cabinet members, only one of them is an African American. And that's Eric Holder. We can no longer remain silent. When you look at the fact that uh, People are being nominated to Supreme Court. I can't tell you how many women uh, have been nominated, but we have not had one African-American female nominated to Supreme Court. We cannot re remain silent anymore. And I share this with you because I wrote this article in March. Uh, on April 2nd, uh, the new president of Morehouse, who actually preached at my church in June of last year, um, called me and said, Kevin, uh, the president is going to speak at Morehouse. This is the first time a sitting president has ever spoken at Morehouse College for commencement. It's a big to-do. Everybody's all excited. Dr. Wilson used to be over at HBCU office over at the White House. And Dr. Wilson called me and asked for me to be the back large speaker. So the billing is President Obama and the back large Kevin Johnson. But after my article came out on April 15th, 
a president for everyone except black people. A Morehouse graduate, Dr. Wilson is a Morehouse graduate, deeply trained in the prophetic social gospel teaching that we're talking about here today, called me on April 15th, April 15th, and suggested that I should withdraw from being the baccalaureate speaker. Now you have to understand how powerful this would be for a young man when you look at all of the images that are taking place in the hip hop culture, when you have young folk who don't even know who Dr. Martin Luther King is, and yet you have a young man who's trying to uphold his principles. On this past Saturday, I received a phone call, I was at my son's soccer game, and uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson called me on my cell phone and he said, Kevin, he said, I just left Morehouse College in a kind of joking preacher way. And he said, and Dr. King, I saw him, he was hanging on a cross. <laughs> and he said, I just want to know, has he been resurrected? And I said to him, I said, I don't know if he's been resurrected, but I am trying to live out the principles and teachings that Dr. King left us. And then on April 16th, uh, Dr. Wilson made it clear that they were going to move in a different direction. Instead of having one speaker, which has been Morehouse's tradition for these 146 years, that they were now going to have three speakers. And I said to Dr. Wilson, I said, do you not understand that April 16th, 1963, is the day that Dr. King penned the letter from Birmingham jail? Fifty years later, we're still having this discussion. And when you begin to look at not only just the letter from Birmingham jail, when you look at the fact that this is the 50th year of the March on Washington, which took place on August, in August 28, 1963, when you look at the fact that this is the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation that allowed for slaves to be set free, and even when you look at this as the 45th anniversary when Dr. King was killed in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th, here we are still having this conversation. I believe Dr. King said it best. There comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor political nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. In a world in which so many people are not taking a position, I dare to take a position as it relates to what's taking place in Philly with our schools. I dare to take a position whenever I see injustice. I dare to take a position because if we do not speak up, then who will? Thank you. I want to continue to reflect on that theme of speaking up, but I first want to briefly get you situated in events we sort of know, sort of popular cultural images. So with the dramatic details to situate the letter, it's Fred Shuttlesworth, the fearless man who took on violent racists years before King came to town with a whole movement behind him that met once a week for five years and challenged ceaselessly. And when he would Klan blew him up and he was flying out the door on his mattress, he thought, I feel the hands of the everlasting Lord underneath me and I knew he intended for me to deliver my people. One tough character. We know those mass meetings with the sounds vibrating with, I woke up with my mind, stayed on freedom, and I'm on my way to Canaan land. The defiant young people who in King, who had a cautious streak and was getting nervous about using the young people, but they had run out of adults who were willing to go to jail. 
And while King and Shuttlesworth and Abernathy were out of town, Andy Young and Jim Bevel, who'd been organizing these kids, exactly along the lines that Joyce Miller <laughs> suggested, went out and basically took on Bull Connor. And the very next day, that diabolical Bull Connor, he had kept it together on May 2nd, which was D-Day, but on May 3rd, he was not gonna let these people push him around. And then he struck back with the fire hoses and the snarling dogs. And so Connor played his part as an actor, in the, as a prop in the movement drama to awaken the nation. Finally, John Kennedy, who had been silent and diffident and evasive, so much so that King was so angry about Kennedy not proclaiming another Emancipation Proclamation, stayed away from the White House. Passive aggressive, but only vaguely passive, more aggressive than passive, that he wasn't gonna go through that ceremony. Finally, Kennedy awakening to the point as he saw those dogs' fangs in the stomach of that by black bystander, realizing he could no longer avoid racism and segregation as a moral and a national issue, and before long, the momentum towards the Civil Rights Bill of 1964, the March on Washington, and then on September 15, the revenge murder of four little black girls in 16th Street Baptist Church. It is not unfair to say that in those four to six months in the spring and summer of 1963, 50 years ago, the foundations of the old racial order in America cracked. And nothing ever happens in a split second. And as the revenge killing of those four girls reminded King, and King really didn't rem need reminding, that there would be many valleys even with the occasional mountaintops, and it would be a long haul, and there would be plenty, mortar, plenty martyrs along the way in St. Augustine, in Demopolis, in Selma, on and on. Now, we also need to be careful to remember that victory wasn't, wasn't ordained. Before King wrote the letter, the demonstrations in Birmingham went from April 3rd to April 12th, and they were to culminate in Good Friday. King was gonna go thinking, maybe he would go to a jail on Good Friday, but he wasn't sure. But it wasn't hateful whites that first discouraged King, but diffident blacks. 95% of the black clergy in Birmingham did not support the movement. As Reverend Allen was discussing, The protest began and the black people of Birmingham didn't rise to the call. So when you listen to the recordings, and one of the things I do in the Gospel of Freedom is I not only have the benefit of spending a lot of time interviewing all of King's colleagues over a long period, but I have rare, I had access to rare recordings. So you hear King before he goes to jail talking in mass meetings to black people and after he gets out. And it's not that he talked one way to white people and another to black people, but you have to understand what he sounds like talking to black people to understand what's left out of the written word. And you gotta fill it in. And you hear a bitter, angry king. We don't wanna make him Saint Martin. He was a human prophet if he was a prophet. And he says, those Negroes who are not fit to be free are traitors to their race. That's not the majestic king. It's, you don't hear him like that. But he was dispirited that people did not rise to the call. Already in March, before the demonstrations began against Bull Connor and segregation in Bombingham, as it was called, <laughs> Dynamite Hill was the area that blacks lived on, and as um, you can hear James Bevel, a younger firebrand, prophet of King's SCLC orbit, on Friday night, talking in the mass meeting, saying, Dr. King is in jail, but you, these white people don't understand the resurrection. You can put him in jail on Good Friday, but he will get up. And he says, Negroes of Birmingham, do you want to be free? Bull Connor doesn't control freedom. God controls freedom. 
But back in March, King is saying, the Israelites got all mixed up on that. And he's acting in the voice of God. And he describes Moses coming to him and saying the children of Israel are complaining. When are you going to take them to the promised land? And God, this is King, assuming God's voice is saying, tell the children of Israel to go forward. And then King says, don't sit around waiting for me to do it all by myself. And you hear a tired Reverend Allen talk about King's discouragement and exhaustion at the end, but he always went through these moments when he spiraled down. And you hear the irritation, I can't do it all myself. So I can't stress this enough. If the letter from Birmingham jail was a moral statement about whites should do and fail to do, the gospel of freedom that King preached also included things that black people should do and had failed to do. That's what the mass meetings were about. And so the gospel of freedom was demanding all God's children had to show moral courage. Nobody was exempt. So after much indecision, King has been depressed, can't make up his mind what to do. He decides to violate the injunction and go to jail. And he would suffer with Christ, his savior, up there on the cross, how many times had King preached, they can put you in a jail and transform you to glory? That's what he said in Albany just a year before. He said it in all kinds of places. But King had a crisis of the spirit, and he spiraled down into panic and depression in the jail. He was in solitary and separated from Abernathy. He never did well when he was separated from Abernathy. Everything changed for King when he read the letter, a statement by eight white clergy, the most moderate, enlightened white clergy in the state of Alabama, criticizing him as an extremist, accusing him of precipitating violence. So we need to think about King. He'd been depressed. He'd fallen into a panic. He fasted in prison. In prison. He'd been in solitary. And suddenly, reading this letter, He's surging up out of the valley, back up the mountain on a tide of indignation. And here's the important part of this, that you need to understand the letter. That it begins in an act of black pain and black anger. Yes, there is the philosophy, there is theology, there is a learned treatise. It's a great moment of communication about the justification of civil disobedience and why it's okay to protest. But it begins in that anger. The driving force was not fancy philosophy, but King's exasperation. And as Wyatt T. Walker once put it to me, and he's put it this way many times, Martin's cup of endurance runneth over. So that's the starting point. Now the letter, and, and, you know, it, and that's what, so he's, in, this probably happens on the 15th of April. And very few people have heard an unknown preached version of the letter that I discovered. It's in a mass meeting right after he gets out of jail. And you hear a more down home, southern inflected king that white people didn't have as much access to. And he says, you're in jail. And you meet a friend sometimes, and they got to bring you some dinner, and they got to bring you some lunch, and they say, Reverend, I know what you represent, and I'll sneak you the paper. So the letter begins in an act of black solidarity as well. And when you hear King in the mass meetings, whenever he was the badass king or the down-home king, you hear the people, because they loved his refinement. But when he fell into this other king, they just explode with just glory. They love hearing. They know this. They're intimate with this king as well, who's not the public dignified king, but he's something else as well. So the letter and the man that come rippling off these pages has a glorious complexity. So let's just think about it. There are the constant displays of his splendid manners. He was a Morehouse man, after all, and a member of the black bourgeoisie. So, my dear fellow clergyman, I do have a recording after he gets out, he's saying, these preachers are calling us naughty, but they're my dear fellow clergymen. <laughs> my Jewish and Christian brothers, right? It's very, I know that you're a sincere man, there's also the professor, King, 
who's schooling these clergy in the tenets of their own faith. It sounds like very, you know, let me tell you what Martin Buber and Paul Tillich said, but if you think of it in terms of 1963, the cocky black man telling the white man, you don't even understand your own religion, people thought this is a weak man. No, he was a refined and complex man who was not without black anger, but it was always refracted through his intellect and majesty. There's the tour he takes whites on a voyage into the inner recesses of black suffering. It's a sentence that's almost 300 words long. And he loses his syntax at the end. When your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, when you have to find yourself stammering, explaining to a six-year-old girl why she can't go to fun town. Well, that's his daughter, that's Yolanda. And when King preaches that at Mount Zion Baptist Church during the Watts riot, he perfectly captures Yoki's little girl. Daddy, you know, I've been seeing on the TV about fun town and I want you to take me to fun town. King was a great mimic, a man of every voice of all kinds, but he's revealing what it's like when you, when you, when you, when you were suffering from a profound sense of nobodiness, just when you think he's going to explode, he pulls out of the swoon and says, then maybe you will understand why we find it hard to wait. There's the traveler king who goes on a road trap trip into the white soul. He says, I have often driven through the magnificent spires of the white south, and I've looked at your churches and said, and wondered, who worships there? Who is their God? In the mass meetings, he will use that same phrase after Bull Connor uses the hoses the first day. And he says, they will stand before their God, covered in the barbarity, their God, as if maybe he doesn't even share the same God with those people. And finally, there's that staccato embrace of extremism. And he's going through all this affable, saying, no, no, I'm not extreme. No, 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 they're the black nationalists, and then they're the people adjusted. I'm moderate like you are. And then he turns on a dime and says, the more I thought about it, I took pleasure in saying, I am an extremist because Jesus was an extremist. Amos was an extremist. Let justice roll down like water. So it's a roller coaster of a document. And I've been teaching it for 20 years. And every year, I hear things. Literally, I hear the words now. I'm not freaking out back in the 60s. It's <laughs> You can add the sound as he goes through this, but more than anything else, the letter becomes a relentless smackdown of whites, of ordinary white people who seem indifferent to the suffering and humanity of black people. He says it's not the Klan who's the stumbling block. This is an attack on the core of American culture. And it's not that they're racist. They may think they're fine people, but they don't care. They don't understand the democracy they take for granted is a democracy for white people. And it's a smackdown of the hypocritical clergymen who cooperated with evil. Maybe they recoiled from George Wallace as a brute, but they would say, obey the desegregation laws because it's the law, but this is what galled King. But they would not say, because the Negro is your brother. They would not say that. And C.T. Vivian, who's one of the great stalwarts of Nashville nonviolence, you know, I've had the privilege of reading through the letter with most of King's colleagues, and C.T. just perks up with this. He's saying, he's doing what the Old Testament prophets do. He's telling them of their evil, because that's what a prophet does. So they, too, bore complicity. Their sins were of omission, but they were no less damning. So as this furious truth-telling suggests, despite the swerves, the letter has a direction. And the way I try to describe it in the letter, at the midpoint, King shifts from being the diplomat trying to convince whites of the justice of the black cause, and he mainly becomes a prophet ready to chide and chastise them. The prophet comes to the fore, and it's as if we are meeting King anew. At least the king that most of whites think they know, but also many black people think they know. The ambassador of brotherhood, it turns out, was a tough Christian warrior. Underneath the refinement, 
He was a Christian warrior. He wasn't naive about the power of moral appeal to change white hearts and minds absent protest and raising tension. His theory of communication was pretty clear. You can't communicate earnestly and morally because people won't even consider what you're saying until you awaken their consciousness. And you have to force them to do it through some pretty tough, nonviolent, as Joy said, but tough measures. He didn't really think very many whites had much empathy. What does he say in the letter? This isn't so far, actually, from Malcolm X, as different as they are. But what he says, I came to realize that very few members of the oppressor race can understand the groans and yearnings of the oppressed race. Now, King never stopped reaching out to whites. He had many white friends. He welcomed them in the movement. He hallows the Christians. They were prophetic Jews. There were all kinds of people, but they were a mar minority. And he says, they are big in quality, but few in quantity. So he had no illusions about what he was up against. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. You don't have to be a literary critic to hear the cold fury that's underneath that. But when you hear King preach that days after getting to jail, out of jail, there's no doubt of what the roiling within his soul is. His cup runneth over. So toward the end of the letter, King observes, I have no fear about the outcome in Birmingham. And I want to move towards the end by reflecting on this. And then we'll have time for about 15 minutes of questions. And, um, but, but I want to raise what to me is one of the most interesting things in all of the letter. The movement re remained in peril. He got out of jail on April 20th. Still two weeks from the young people in the Black Soul DJ on the Birmingham station saying, kids, tomorrow there's a picnic in the park. Bring your toothbrush. <laughs> and the next thing you know, a 1,000 black kids are climbing out the window of Parker High School and every other high school because they know you need your toothbrush if you're going to jail. <laughs> so the movement is in peril in these days. And King actually has one meeting with some of the white clergy. And the other, the clergy, if you have a question about it, I'll get into that, because that, that's very complicated. And King never sent them the letter, which really burned many of them for decades. But in any case, at that meeting, he leaves the meeting and says, they're pitiful. <laughs> they think we're communists. You know, How can you talk to these people? So where did King find his confidence? And when you think of it, we know the answer to that, because the answer was in his faith. So what he would have said is, there is a bomb in Gilead. My God is able. The Lord will make a way out of no way. The resurrection follows the crucifixion. The promised land lies behind bondage. He doesn't say that. Now, why, it, you know, for a long time, it just, was, it, it just struck me, why doesn't he say this when he's addressing eight clergy in a document that has secular, rational argument often has the quality of a sermon. And the answer is, he has disdain for them. He will not share his spiritual thought with them. He can't bring himself, because that's the answer. But there's almost no statements in the whole of letter about America is destined for democracy. There is one little sentence that sounds like the American dream. What does King, where does he find his confidence? And this is the part of King we have to understand. Along with his love of humanity was his deep sense of black solidarity. And what he says at the end, and people don't read this sharply enough, and it's actually there at the March on Washington, too, if you know how to hear it. He goes into a form of ancestor worship for his beloved slaves in his sermons. They are full of shout outs of praise to the slave ancestors. And what King says is, even if the white church won't come to our aid, I have no fear that the present setbacks will put us back. Abused and scorned though we may be, we were here before the pilgrims. We were here before Thomas Jefferson etched the mighty words of the Declaration 
across the pages of history. There's something more primal in the black experience in black history that sustains him before he gets to all that civic culture in Thomas Jefferson. And immediately, keep in mind, abused and scorned is the title, buked and scorned, of a slave spiritual. That King asks Mahalia Jackson to sing before he speaks at the March in Washington. So even as he's speaking the American dream, he's signaling those who can hear, I, as a black man, am reading American history in terms of the black experience of it. The slave answer, and remember, the slaves have the last word. In the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, he turns whites into blacks for a moment so they can sing. Protestants and Gentiles and Jews, Protestants and Catholics who can all sing, free at last, free at last, we are free at last. And the very next paragraph is, Another one of his favorite forms of preaching his love of the black ancestors. For 200 years, our ancestors made Cotton King. They built the mansions of the South. And if the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the temporary setbacks we have in Birmingham will not stop us now. He finds solace in something very powerful. And it's the power of his people as well as his Christianity. Now, it's easy to see the lurch forward in, Bur in Birmingham as inevitable. And Obama sometimes talks in this, right? He says, we as a people will get there. But King really mean we as a people, we as a black people will get there. And he didn't share Obama's image of the fallible nation destined to perfect itself, as King saw it, America was not a redeemer nation, but a nation in need of redemption. And so I want to close on, this becomes clear in one of the most dramatic discoveries in my book. In the Gospel of Freedom, this alternative version of the letter I found, he preached it on April 22nd, and it helps you a lot of what's going to get into I Have a Dream is in that speech. And it helps you understand what he's kind of soft peddling in the dream, but it's there as well. You can hear the angry tremor in King's voice as he declares, and we are through with segregation now, henceforth, and forever. And it's the same defiance you hear right after Connor has used the fire hoses and dogs. And King says he's been first stunned at white barbarity, and then he's talking about who is their God, and now he's ready to lighten it up. And he says, you know, I was down, and he kind of does this stammer thing when he's being his down home funny. He says, you know, when I, I was underground at the courthouse and I saw a tank, and I said, what is that? And they said, well, that's Bull Connor's tank. And he looks up at the audience and says, you know, it's a white tank. And again, you hear, the 16th Street Baptist Church bucking him up and just cracking up at the refined minister. And then he says, they can get their water and they can get their dogs. And even Bull Connor can get his, black, his white tank and our black faces will stand up to his white tank. So I want to give you a little feel for this defiant king. And then I'll make one final point and we can close and take a few questions.
So I raised the question then was, there's a moment at the end of this preached version where King breaks into the sound of my country tis of thee. And we will hear him do that at the March on Washington. And I just want to sort of ask the question, was this a celebration of American exceptionalism? And the answer of the idea that we were destined for democracy. And the answer is hardly. King's pronouncement in that church, if America is to be a great land, says it at the March on Washington, it was a taunt. America wasn't a great land, and yet, if blacks were, quote, to be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, if they were able to sing it at all, they first had to, quote, bring that day. And King says, by protesting together, and going to jail together. In short, the nation that most white Americans thought they lived in wouldn't exist until black people created it. 